Week third. Nope. Just kidding. Week 12 of the NFL had a lot going on. We had three, count them, three great Thanksgiving games, a bunch of very good to great to some terrible Sunday games, a very interesting Monday night game, and then we're going to look into a very crucial week 13. So action pack show. We have the crew with you. Alex Young is off doing something important, I assume. So we have, again, uh, one less person, so hopefully everybody's back next week. But we have Rachel Brian McKeon. What's up, Brian? Great to see you again with your. How new- we doing, everyone? You were the first ever person to walk out on this show, so um, <laughs> we kept a good oh. streak going until you had to go. I tell you, it was the scariest moment ever when your computer just dies on you in, in the middle of a podcast. Oh yeah, no, I I know what you mean, man. We're not going with this doesn't happen here. Um. But great to see you again, Brian, for sure. Alex Rodelio is here. What's up, Alex? Happy to see all gentlemen back. Well, shout out to UConn for running the table. Eighth in the country. Let's go. How about that? Go Huskies there. Maybe even see him in a bowl game. Uh, uh, Desmond Price is here. What's up, Desmond? Nothing much. A lot of good games in the NFL this week. Ready to talk about them. Hell yes. And I've been really looking forward to the. I, was, I do every week, but... uh. This is a there's a lot going on, especially this week and next week. So first, I want to talk about the New York Jets. Mike White wound up coming back. He got selected after we recorded as the Jets starting quarterback. And they ultimately went 31 to 10. And Mike White, for the second year in a row, comes in and takes the uh, NFL by storm. Let's just look at some of these numbers first. And then we'll get to our Thanksgiving games. But Mike White. 22 for 28, 315 yards, three touchdowns. Almost uh, put all Zach Wilson's really good games into one and um, has keeping the starting position. The Jets are 7 and 4. Now, one thing we do have to make apparent they played a weak Bears team where they had a result to, they had to resort to their second string quarterback. And there was even rumors they were going to their third string up until game time. But uh, nothing worked at all for the Bears on both sides of the ball. And uh, they really missed Justin Fields. So as I have some people in my life here in the Northeast, absolutely love Mike White. They really think that he's Jesus. They really think he's going to be have a Tom Brady story. The hype for him is real, despite only starting three NFL games, going two and one. But hey. He uh, made it work this time and made him at least forget about Zach Wilson. And then there's some people who, you know, are understand what we ha- what he's worth. Is he the starting quarterback next season? Likely not, especially if this team is advancing as fast as they are. But bottom line, he played better than Zach Wilson. And I have to ask you guys who are level-headed with passion. Mike White, is this hype for real or is it just a fluke? And um, tying into that question is, can Mike White be responsible for the Jets to for the Jets to make the playoffs this year? I'm going to say to be determined just because last season he had a phenomenal first start and then he continued to decline, I think, in those two other starts he had. So, yeah, I got destroyed by Buffalo at Buffalo yeah. and then an indie game. Yeah, so, you know, I'd like to see more of a sample size for him. But he has the intangibles. He has the discipline, the pocket awareness. He has that deep uh, uh, the deep threat ability with that strong arm. So he's making all the right decisions that Zach Wilson couldn't. And he was account- accountable and he was disciplined. That's what really this team needs. It just needs someone to be poised um, at um, behind the center. And really, you know, just rely on that defense. Just, you know, do he needs a game manage, and he can do that. Um, I think they'll ride with him for the rest of the season if he continues on this path. Um, but, you know, in the future, you know, he's, in my opinion, just the way this team is on track to, you know, be a contender in the next two, three seasons. Uh, I see him as a very good backup for this team that when a starter, a qualified starter does go down, they can rely on him for two or three games. Yeah, I, I'm i kind of in the same place you're in, Brian, that wait-and-see place. I'm looking at the next two games for the Jets. They're going at Minnesota and then at Buffalo. So, I mean, we won't have to wait too long to figure out who exactly Mike White is. I mean, after Clearly. those two games, you're going to know like what he can do against you know top-tier NFL teams, 
who both admittedly have struggling defenses, but still on that stage, we should get a pretty good feel for what he's able to do. I mean, three games is not that much of a sample size. We've been saying the same thing about Kenny Pickett this year and like whether or not he's good or not down in Pittsburgh. So we can't really crown somebody after three games. Also, as you mentioned, Matt, the Bears defense over the last five games, the least amount of points they've let up has been 27. The least. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, and they gave away their two best everybody. players in this uh, middle of the season. Yeah. The, the Bears are getting torched by everybody. So, I, I want to wait to see what he does next week before we talk about like how good Mike White actually is. Yeah. And like I said, some people, even despite that, they just see yeah. the win and they just see the numbers and they love this guy. I don't, I don't, I don't get sure. it. I mean, I get it, but I don't get it. Yeah. You were saying, Alex? Yeah. You definitely don't want to put the carriage before the horse too quickly. But, um, I think that, you know, it's, it, you know, I'm kind of echoing what all you guys have said. It, you know, it is a little too early to tell. I think that this, the game, the story of this game is more about the Jets' dominant defense. They kept the entire team in Chicago to 292 yards. And I think it allowed and put him in simple short, uh, short yardage situations for Mike White to get a lot of easy scores because they're not stopping anybody, Chicago. So I think that, you know, with the jury still being out, I think he just needs to, you know, run a conservative offense, continue to, you know, execute the playbook and just lean on that defense and lean on the, you know, the, the star draft picks that they've acquired the past two years under Joe Douglas. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens, but it just kind of, I think it's more of a referendum on Zach Wilson in the long haul, just to see what even a competent backup quarterback can do. Um, particularly if they do win or split with these next two weeks coming up. The Jets have a top five defense. This is a championship yeah. defense. They've only, yep. I think they are currently yep. a quarterback away from being a contender. So if Mike mm-hmm. White can play well against the Vikings and the Bills, I mean, watch out for the Jets in the playoffs. Yeah. The way and, is. and we'll discuss when we go over the games next week, especially with how tight the division race is going to be. But yeah. Bottom line, you just had to get rid of Zach Wilson was holding it back. And again, I don't know if Mike White, I don't, let's just say, I don't know if the Jets starting quarterback next season is on the roster right now. And, you know, like you said, Desmond, when you have a stellar defense like they do, which includes the best corner in the game and arguably one of the best pass rushers, Quinn Williams and Sauce Gardner. Um, this is your win now moment, especially for this team and franchise who have not been in the playoffs since 2010, the longest, the longest streak in the entire NFL. And with how we know how, how fast this league goes, this is a win now team already at, uh, the quarterback game was, uh, the big difference maker. And if he could, um, and if he could do well, especially against this, especially against the Buffalo bills, um, that division game in two weeks, then uh, we'll be talking here. So interesting stuff. Mike White creating headlines, and um, we should expect him to start next week. Now let's transfer that to the Thanksgiving games. Three, three very good, very good games. I was very, very, very happy to see as everybody was enjoying their festivities on Thursday. We could first talk about the Bills and Lions, which Bills win again. But they're not making it easy. But at the end of the, at the towards the end of the fourth quarter, Detroit winds up tying, give enough room for Josh Allen, and they score a game-winning field goal towards the end of regulation. Bills only win by a slight margin of twenty-eight to five. This was a great uh, backdoor cover if you vote if you uh, wagered on the lines. I think the big takeaways out of this game is the Bills still have injury problems plaguing them, and the Lions. If only they uh, grabbed a couple of wins earlier in the season, they would truly be in the mix. But again, when you have a difficult defense as they do, reckon um, maybe you could get a moral victory for holding this uh, Buffalo Bills team to just 28 points, even though that is still a lot. It's better than the 30 and 40 point games they were given up to weaker teams. Um, Buffalo, I, I you can't see them as a dominant team moving forward until everybody's healthy and if that. That's what I got out of this game. What did you guys get out of it? Uh, yeah, I think the most staggering stat that I saw was um, what, with Von Miller being injured in this game, and it sounds like he didn't tear his ACL, but he's probably going to be out for maybe the end of the season. Um, he is the number one like pass rusher on their team. I, I think like he's had like – let me take up my stats here. He has 38 pressures this season. 
And apparently the next closest person to him after that only has 12. So his production alone is just so much more than anybody else on that Bills defense. And between him and the injuries in the secondary, this Bills defense is vulnerable right now. So yeah, Josh Allen and the offense can go out there and they can light it up every week. But, you know, if you're constantly having to feel like you have to score on every possession and you're a team who struggles in one possession games, I yep. mean, they almost blew it to the Lions this past week. I think the Bills are really vulnerable right now. That's what I took out of the game. Yeah. Very, very I, bad for Buffalo. Very bad. I'm going to go as far as to say that. I couldn't agree with you more. I also think that they're still missing the number one corner, who's a top five cornerback in the league in Tredavious White. But like, look what Amon mm-hmm. Ross St. Brown did to this team with an average quarterback in Jared Goff. Kudos to the to the Detroit Detroit Lions offense because every week they come to play and are yeah. putting up top three. I think they they probably have dropped down a little bit, but they're probably still a top three offense in the league. And it really is a shame because this Detroit team should be a playoff team just based on their offensive loan uh, offense alone and their special teams. If you took those two thirds of the game out of it, um, you know they're looking eventually to you know they're still in the rebuild, so good for them, but. Really, when it comes down for the Bills, I saw this uh, stat that Nick Wright mentioned. Um, in the last seven games, Josh Allen has identical stats to Davis Mills. And you cannot go to the Super Bowl, cannot do well in the playoffs, make it to the divisional round. If your quarterback, who you, you know, are going to, you know, I think they, they paid him, paid, paid money, is an MVP kind of guy playing like Davis Mills, who's now a bench for a uh, journeyman. Kyle Allen. So this is the and, problem they have right now. He's hurt or he's just regressing and they need to figure this out now. Yeah. You know, they got they got holes all over that secondary. Um they're not going to be healthy for another, you know, handful of weeks. And they still have a lot of divisional games down at the end of the stretch of the season. Um I'm really concerned, particularly when you have a, a team like um like Detroit that's just pushing pushing your team around. Um, you know, we know that when Buffalo is dominant, when they're on, they're really dominant, but they really haven't had a lot of standout games, um, particularly since week eight. And I, and I think that, you know, uh, in a combination of not being healthy, but also having, you know, a bend, not break defense is really going to hurt them because it's going to put more weight back on Josh Allen's offense to, you know, uh, get back to course and course correct. And I don't think that they're in a position where Josh Allen, you know, uh, is able to do that. I saw him overthrowing guys. I saw him seeing ghosts behind his shoulder, um, just being really indecisive. And I don't know if that's so much of a byproduct of Dayball leaving, um, where in, in the years past, he was able to kind of correct midseason and and get the team back in, in stride where they're supposed to be. But um, they have a lot of worries on this offense, and the defense is not doing them any uh, any favors by not being on the field. Yeah, I think the the last thing I wanted to mention here is like if, if we're looking at like the Bills in totality, a month ago we all had them as the clear cut favorite to go to the Super Bowl. Yeah, like they we they were the best team in the NFL. Now, no debate. Now you're thinking about is like, well, the Chiefs probably could beat them, the Dolphins probably could beat them, the Bengals could probably beat them, and the state that they're currently in with this banged up defense. So I think they've taken a huge step back in the last three weeks. Does this really show that Buffalo really is a cursed franchise? I mean, you couldn't have better as not to uh, um, repeat your point, but you just couldn't have as much momentum as this team did. And then I guess well, an NFL season took place, and Buffalo now has questions against him. I wouldn't say that this is too much of a signifier of being a cursed franchise, which that I also separately think that they kind of are. I think there's a black hat running around at some point, but I do think that this just goes to show you that there's ebbs and flows to an 18 week season, and a lot of teams are riding these really huge swings throughout a season in a long year. So I think that it's about being healthy at the right time, and they're just not there right now. Yeah, I'll mention this for, like, the last comment is, would it have been better to sit Josh Allen for two weeks when he was hurt and let him heal up a little bit? Because this is a limited offense in scheme, I've noticed, and it's a more of a conservative approach, which you could see now with relying on the run game and being more balanced. Um, which could be by design or because of the lack of ability to, you know, have these throws. But, you know, he's 24 or 42. He's really, he's overthrowing, he's underthrowing. It looks like he's not making these plays. And you could just tell that based off of, I always will say, Stefan Diggs will always put up good numbers. But look at that number two receiver, Gabriel Davis, who had huge games in the beginning of the season, dwindling because he's a deep threat. And why usually 
deep threats when they don't do bad is either because of drops or because of the limited arm of a quarterback. And as a result right now, we're seeing some unlucky drops and a limited quarterback making these throws. So they're losing the big chunk plays that they usually have. Rip it out of your heart, but well, especially with this big Thursday night game, the Bills season is truly on the line, especially with the division with that. If they lose to new England, they will be own three in the division. And you could argue that their season well, that their division hopes will be completely done. You can't make up all those games, especially um, if the Jets put uh, get a couple of wins this week and next week as well. So Buffalo, your season's on the line right now. This is why we love December football. But um, but we'll see ultimately what Josh Allen pulls off and that uh, stellar, or at one point stellar, Buffalo Bills offense can do. So let's uh, soak it all in right now by first talking about the Patriots and Vikings first. <laughs> um, and then we'll take it in after that. So Kirk Cousins wins a primetime game. It was a high-scoring game. Uh, Justin Jefferson, as long as he's available, um, he's literally a cheat code out there. Stellar offensive performance. You know, Big Bill keeps that game close, but we then see a questionable call and this huge debate: what is a catch, what's not? When we see the uh, Patriots, when we see the Patriots tight end clearly seem to have possession of the ball, it wasn't close to his chest, but they caught it right in his hands. But it wasn't good enough. It was even reviewed down, and it was even reviewed uh, down in New York, and they still said no catch. And again, I don't. We, we can either start this with what a catch is, what what is a catch, and what's not. But um, we'll first go and talk about um the game itself. Does anybody feel any more confident about the Minnesota Vikings beating this Patriots team at all, and um what they could produce moving forward? And um, would you say now is this a top NFC team? I still think that they're fool's gold, but I think this is yeah. a good moral victory for Kirk Cousins who can't win in prime time. You know, getting your first prime time win is a big deal. You know, he's going to enjoy it, uh, savor in it. Maybe it'll give him a little more confidence when he goes into these night games as we go into winter more and more. Uh, and, you know, it was a well put together game to them, um, game by them, by the offense. The defense struggled against a, a lackluster of Patriots offense. So I'm a, it's, it shows concern for the defense to allow 26 points by the Patriots. Um, but I also think that the Patriots had their best offensive game of the season in the passing game, uh, minus um, Stevenson and Harris not really having a good running game. But uh, overall, good game. And, yeah, definitely some lessons learned for the Vikings here. I think the Vikings are going to enter the postseason as either the number one or the number two seed, and they will m possibly be the most overrated of – those like of a number one or number two seed maybe ever i mean the rest of their schedule's cake i mean i, I mean they're gonna play the lions the colts the packers who are beat up the bears who are beat up and then they'll have a tough game against the giants and the jets but like mostly they're gonna breeze right into the postseason they might not lose more than like one or two more games tops and I just am not buying this team. I mean, they let the Patriots run up and down the field on them. Yes, they ultimately won the game, but the Patriots had an anemic offense all year, scored 26 on them. Two weeks before that, the Buffalo Bills scored 30 on them. The week before the, the week in between there, Dallas scores 40 on them. Like they've given up 32 points a game in the last three games. So they're getting torched right now on defense. And if your defensive strategy is let's hope that Kirk Cousins scores on every single possession, then you're ultimately just setting yourself up for failure. I'm sorry. And when you get up against these better teams in the postseason, you're going to get exposed the same way Dallas exposed them a few weeks ago. So, yeah, I think you're right, Brian. is fool's gold with the Vikings. And, yes, Kirk Cousins did well. The Vikings offense did well. But, you know, you play on both sides of the ball. And so, yeah, it's great your offense is doing great. But where's your defense at? So I guess I'll kind of result to being the Vikings apologist for the show. I'll kind of adopt that role. Um, I, you know, you guys talk about like fool's gold and I kind of want to just qualify that statement. 
what what I see with this team is fool's gold as I see them more as a six and five or seven and four. I definitely don't see them as a nine and two because of how they're winning close tight games. There's always going to be a team that just wins out and, and has kind of that strike, you know, of luck uh, in one particular season. But I do think that this game in particular was more of a coaching battle that uh, Belichick was able to keep this team close. I think going into this game, we a lot of people had questions and still do have concerns about the Patriots offense, as do I. And I think that when you limit a team to 45 rushing yards, when Stevenson's a monster and that's kind of their identity to their offense, I think it does say a lot about the Vikings defense, even if you do give up 400 yards, because this is not really a lockdown defense for, for Minnesota. Um, I thought that Cousins, you know, you're not going to rely on him to win you all these games and shootouts, but I thought that him rising to the occasion to win a, um, you know, a night game and, um, you know, a, a big, a big quality win, I think does show a little bit about this team more than we want to give it credit for. But if you were to ask me gun to my head about what I think about this team, I think that they will kind of backdoor into the second seed in the weaker NFC. But I do think that there's, there's of course, you know, questions for concern with anybody, uh, in this conference, except for Philadelphia right now. So I think that they're kind of closer in terms of quality to a seven and five, uh, seven and four or a six and five. But I do think that this is a legit team. No, I think you're making great points, Alex. I think the Vikings are a playoff team. I just think that, you know, typically when you see a team who's nine and two and could possibly be the one seed, you would assume that that team's a top five team in the NFL. Right. And I think if we all said what our top five teams are in the NFL, I don't think any of us would put the Vikings in our top five. No. I wouldn't. Even, I don't even have them in my top three in the NFC. Right. So it's mm-hmm. just they're just. I think there's a little over hype, but yeah, they're, oh, they, they're a playoff right. team. The only question I have is too is what is this team without Justin Jefferson? I mean, uh, they they lose so many points. I don't have the exact number, but um. You lose Jeff Jefferson, who's been healthy the whole time, and let's keep it that way. That team, I mean, Adam Thielen is in, is good, but he's not the old Adam Thielen we saw a couple of years ago. And um, in addition, Hawkins has been big too, but Justin Jefferson is uh, the major point, uh, the major reason of them getting points. So to count that, if, if he has a bad game, then it's slow for that team. I think one final ca- feather in their cap too is that they are able to kind of invert their offense and where they used to be Dalvin cook centric in the past. um, And, you know, in tight situations, they had to rely on Kirk cousins, you know, and that wasn't um, to their, to their, you know, that was to their detriment. Uh, I think that they're able to their ability to win through the air and then rely on a defense does show some of their strength. Um, I think that getting away from the run, um, you know, is, is, so, you know, it's something to be proud about if you can win games that way. So I just I think that there is something to the team, this team and this identity that they're kind of expanding the offense a little more too. Right, right. I'll make I'll make one comment on that though, is that when you do have a pass happy offense with a lackluster defense, you run into time of possession problems. And this yeah. is where when they hit the playoffs, I need to see the Minnesota's rushing carries go from 27 to like 38 or 40 with Madison and cook getting yeah. at least 15 carries each, because really it's an underutilized running back duo with cook getting the majority of the carries when Madison is probably, you know, a top 50, he could probably start a running back for 15 teams in the league right now, just based on his strength alone. So like they really need to hone in on that run game if they want to, get this defense off the field, their own defense off the field as much as possible. For sure. As you talk about teams that rely on one particular player to have a good game, it seems the same formula happens with the New York football giants and happened again in prime time on Thanksgiving. Ultimately, we see the Dallas Cowboys get another victory over the New York giants. First, the let's just say the first quarter, I thought, hey, maybe there's a shot. And the CD Lamb happened, just getting points after points. Ezekiel Elliott teams to return to form. Tony Pollard had a good game, so that running back by committee as well is um is a pretty pretty secure at this moment. Daniel Jones plays fine, but just not good enough. And with that large spread at nine and a half, it makes sense. And then you know, I mean, the Giants are underdogs at home again, and in a, in a large spread. But um, still, that seeking reality of the New York Football Giants uh, not being as good as their record indicates. 
now, especially as they truly have the hardest schedule moving forward in December. This is going to be some way, some battle for them. Ultimately, I uh, the Giants injury problems, the people they mi- were missing uh, definitely hurt them. But also another thing you can point out is how the Cowboys were letting up on this Giants team and um, they hit a backdoor cover themselves, letting up points late. So I guess the real question I have here, we know the Cowboys are a much better team. We know the Cowboys are likely making the playoffs. The thing I have for you, Brian, as a Cowboys fan, you've seen you've had a great few weeks. You've seen them destroy teams. You've seen them keep it close, doing things well on offense, doing things well on defense, not major injury problems. Is this just... I mean, you have no reason on paper to be nervous about the Cowboys, and they can now make a push for a playoff run again, maybe even get to the conference championship where they haven't had since the mid-90s. But is this just ultimately a ticking time bomb because they are the Dallas Cowboys, yet they've been playing really great football over the past few weeks, and even Mike McCarthy has made some pretty pretty good calls, and he hasn't lost games for them. I'm just going to ask you, is this a ticking time bomb for you, Brian, or... Is this team maybe the one? So they're playing great. They're playing sound football. They're playing balanced. You know, we had a flashback in time Ezekiel Elliott um, game here. Um, yeah, I right? really like what they're doing in the run game. What I, you know, I always thought, you know, Pollard was more of a sideline to sideline guy and Zeke was a north and south runner. I think they do better in the reverse. And I think Ezekiel Elliott now at his age, because he doesn't have the ability to have speed after contact anymore. Um, the sideline to sideline um, running for him is a big advantage because he could bully the cornerbacks a lot better than a middle linebacker or a defensive tackle after contact. And that's what we saw in this game where Pollard, he still has that explosive juice to him where he can bounce off a middle linebacker and still pick up that speed and acceleration a lot quicker. So we're seeing, um, a little change in a type of run style for each player, and they're both doing very well. Uh, the receiving game is is really clicking lately. CD Lamb went off. Michael Gallup had a huge game. I don't know if anyone watched the game. Michael Gallup had ridiculous catches. Oh, I took it all in. He ridiculous was what uh, they thought he was supposed to be that time. He looked like the, there's Brian Jr. right there. I was very impressed by his his ability to make these outlandish catches. And the tight end, they, they have the best potential three, um, three-headed monster at tight end in Schultz, Ferguson, and Hendershot. They're all just athletic dudes that really know how to make plays. And, yeah, am I still worried? Absolutely. Why? Because you have a team like the 49ers and Seattle and the Buccaneers who have multiple – wide receiver ones on their team that could exploit my cornerback two at Anthony Brown or my cornerback three is I don't even know who the, who the slot corner is right now because of how much has been a shuffle over there um, for mm-hmm. them at that position. I'm worried outside of Trayvon Diggs when they play a team like that, they're going to get exposed. Like I was shocked against the Vikings that that Thielen didn't have a huge game because I knew that Diggs would take care of Jefferson and limit him. But I did not. I thought that our QB, uh, cornerback two could not keep up with Thielen. And my uh, my fear is now a healthy Godwin, a Tyler Lockett, or a Metcalf. You know, uh, guys like this could exploit my um bat my you know my lesser defensive players in the secondary. Hmm. So I guess so. Regarding the ticking time bomb, um, they have this team that should break that. I don't want to say curse, but this uh unfortunate this uh, this unfortunate time for us to lose crazy playoff games. But it's just a matter of if the other teams around us play well. Absolutely, I'll also say this though: Dak Prescott's not really playing that well. Like his TD and interception ratio, he's making a lot of you know mistakes. He's you know having a lot of turnovers. If our defense slips up in this game once, we lose the game. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You want me to go next, Alex? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, I was actually impressed with the Giants being able to keep this game close. I mean, their team's been decimated by injuries recently. And they, even at full strength, they're the inferior team. Dallas is, you know, superior in almost every position. So, I mean, the fact they were able to keep this as a one-score game, they went into halftime up 13-7. to 
Uh, I actually was really encouraged by the Giants on here because I think it's for me, I think the Cowboys are definitely going to the playoffs as either the NFC East champion or the number one wild card slot. And if you're the number one wild card slot, you're going to be facing the no the NFC South winners. So we're talking about the Bucks most likely. And I just can't get over how dramatic it would be to go into the playoffs in the first round and have to face Tom Brady. So I'm already kind of laughing about that one in my head, but I'm actually wondering if the, if this is it for the Giants. I think they, you know, we're going to talk about this, you know, a little bit later, but I think they need to win these next two games or I think their season's over. I don't think they make the playoffs. So um but I was encouraged by some some of the things I saw from the Giants, so I think um yeah, all in all, I think we know who the Cowboys are, but um, more interested in seeing what, what's going to happen with the Giants in the next few weeks. Definitely, and we will get into that when we preview the games next week. The only other thing I have related to the Cowboys, I'm just curious what you thought. Um, a picture was released from 1957, Little Rock, Arkansas, where we see Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones, part of a mob of people preventing people of color to join the school. And um, Jerry Jones has acknowledged it's him. He hasn't apologized for it. And I have two questions. One, what do you think of it? And two, remember Dan Snyder said, I have dirt on all these owners. Do you think this is a example of this? And Jerry Jones might be the first one to uh, really get, you know, have skeletons come out of his closet. And could we see more of this if Dan Snyder is responsible for this? I'm just curious on a gossip standpoint. <laughs> Do y'all mind if I take this one first? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if this is the kind of dirt that Dan Snyder has, it's kind of pathetic, honestly. Mm -hmm. I mean, because mm -hmm. that that I think that was a big nothing burger. You're talking about a 14 year old kid in the 1950s yeah. in the South <laughs> who happened to be in a crowd, not actually antagonizing anybody, but just watching what happens. So, I mean, if we're gonna be trying to, you know, legislate morality from like what 60, 70 years ago, I think that's kind of ridiculous, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. You know, if that was a grown man doing that, maybe like last year, it'd be a different story. Right. But I mean, you know, in the South in the 1950s, you got to be kidding me with that type of shit, honestly. So, I mean, like, like truthfully speaking, I think it was something more egregious to be a different story. But given what he was doing in that picture, it feels like a giant just plot of nothing. And yeah. I just wanted to say that as the only black person here, just in case people <laughs> are trying to be like overly sensitive or what have you. I just I thought that it was nothing. So I'm just like, come on now. Yeah, I mean, you can't, yeah, you can't, you know, um, judge uh, pictures from a different time and, and put it and judge it by the current context. I think it is a big nothing burger. If that's what Dan Snyder has is the best of his ability, then, you know, then <laughs> I think he's shown his hand, honestly. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I just want to get, for for me, I just want to like just touch on a couple things with this game because I thought that this was a, a kind of, um, I think there is a point to what Desmond said about the Giants keeping this game close. I thought that, these were kind of two teams that were in two classes of their own going into this game. And I kind of feel that way coming out of it, but I was impressed by how the giants kept it a one score game. Um, despite having Saquon essentially, you know, neutralized uh, throughout this game. I thought that um, a lot of the things that Brian has kind of uh, dinged Dallas on in the past, they kind of did well. They were seven 11 for 11 on third down. That was very impressive. And they won, you know, the run game, obviously 170 to 90 yards. So they kind of really blew that entire time of possession out of out of the water and controlled the pace of the game. Um, I was kind of uh, I was looking at their schedule. I think that going forward, uh, um, Dallas is going to be you know uh, they're going to they're going to be wi wildly happy with what they got. Indianapolis, Houston, Jacksonville. That's as close to three buys that you can get. So I think this is a, you know a chance for you know for Dallas to you know correct things and and tighten the screws and um, get guys healthy, but. Um, uh, I, if you're Brian and, and Dallas, you got to feel really good going into next week. They're I'll either always, three buys or three trap games. Yeah, I'm always <laughs> a skeptic. Jackson, I worry about Jacksonville. After the Jacksonville against the Ravens, I'm a little worried because Lawrence is looking to really pick up steam. I didn't make any Giants comments. I'll make this one, though. Um, the Washington uh, Commanders are better than the New York Giants, hands down right now. They have Ooh. better receivers. Better receivers, okay. offensive line is playing better. The running back duo as a whole is more consistent than a hot and cold Saquon Barkley because Saquon either has a buck 70 or 30 yards. That's how he's always been. Um, and their defensive line in the front seven is a lot better. So to me, honestly, I think the commanders uh, sneak into the seven seed. Um, I wouldn't be shocked. The Giants play them back-to-back -back games, right? 
Yeah. I wouldn't be shocked if they get swept by the Washington. There's our hot take. There it mm-hmm. is. Straight For sure. I definitely internet. want to get it to again use that use definitely that passion when we go for the previews. But to answer this now, um on a take the emotions out of being a Giants fan. I can't exactly disagree, especially with the way they're playing, especially starting six and one have lost three out of the last four. And this is where, especially having Daniel Jones as our quarterback, you have to have the reality with this guy who doesn't have many weapons who can't throw the deep ball. And uh, though his legs are stellar, what else can this offense produce that uh, creates the big holes and problems for the Giants and I don't think that I don't see a sweep going. I do think they can split. And especially if um, if you just some if Saquon somehow has a breakout game, and I know it's going to be tough against an extremely, extremely stellar pass rush with, with a returning Chase Young. Um, New York yes. Giants really if they can make this work and in the way if they would have won this game, if everything went perfectly, if everything went perfectly, I think the Giants can pull off this upset, but uh, it didn't. And all we could say is save that for one of these commanders games. It will get more into detail when we preview the games for next week. And uh, by the way, shouts to the Knicks finally winning a stupid game. I'm pissed at them even they're winning. Um, anyways, let's look to the Sunday games now. The Buccaneers. Damn you, Tom Brady. Maybe I'm a little salty on a wagering standpoint, but we can't put that out there. But... This this game somehow goes to overtime, and Tom Brady can't pull it off. The Browns win, and maybe Jacoby Brissett's final game as the starter for the Browns. And all we could say from this is the Bucks are lucky that they are in such a trash division because this five and six team really shows who the Bucks are. And as mentioned with Brian, with these receiving options, which he did have. Wasn't many injuries. You had a healthy guy when you had Mike Evans, but you couldn't pull it off. This team is uh, on their way to an early exit, even uh, if they get a home playoff game just for being the division winner. Um, Cleveland isn't god-awful, but I do think this was a winnable game for Tampa, and they just didn't pull it off. Desmond, I think you were the one who picked them. Uh, you picked this one. So um, what did you see out of this this matchup? And um, were you... I mean, you were definitely, were you pleasantly surprised or, you know, you just felt like this was what was going to happen? It's been really evident the way that Tom Brady talks about this team that it feels like no matter what he seems to be trying to do behind the scenes, he inexplicably cannot get on the same page with his wide receiver group. It doesn't make a whole lot of yep. sense. Like I think the chemistry between him and Chris Godwin has picked up. But him and Mike Evans are way off target. Um, it feels like every time he throws to Evans, it's just completely off, you know, like off target. And their offense is just a little anemic. And they can't rely mm. on a defense who hasn't been that great all year anyway. I mean, they've been getting just absolutely ran through by great rushing teams all year. And when you're facing Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt, I mean, it especially on the road, it yeah, it definitely felt like it was a really easy trap game. And I think the stat that stands out to me about this Buccaneers team is that they've only scored one more touchdown this year than the Houston Texans. So that offense is dead awful. I'm just, I'm sorry. They're just awful. So like, yeah, if they get into the playoffs and they have to face like a a team like Dallas Cowboys in the first round, I think the Cowboys are finally going to get that playoff win, Brian. (laughs) I think they finally will. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to take this one real quick. I'm sorry, Brian. I don't want to steal your thoughts. Um, I just think that the, the biggest disappointment for this game, because uh, Desmond had a very important point there, was that this team has an operation of how to win um, tight games and, and low scoring games, Tampa. And I think that if you're going to if you're going to dial up and, you know, and, and prepare for Cleveland, you have to shut down Nick Chubb in this run game. And they literally doubled them on paper compared to Tampa's run game. They had no answers uh, for him or Kareem Hunt in, the, in this running in this run game. And they allowed that that offense to be three dimensional the entire the entirety of all four quarters. So I thought that this was just bad coaching on Todd Bowles' fault, in particular when you know you're going on a road in a vulnerable environment. And I think that 
Um, you know, allowing Cleveland to sack Brady three times and get pressure all throughout the game also doesn't help. But if you know that you have one way of winning games, which is tight, low scoring games, you can't let a team continue to keep eating off of you game um, all throughout the game on the ground. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. I think this is just an entire botch by Todd Bowles this entire season. Talk about getting gifted um, a playoff team in the Buccaneers, any Tom Brady team with this receiving core. You could say injuries here and there in the offensive line. I understand the defense isn't playing that well, but like you're a def- you're supposed to be this defensive guru your entire career in coaching. Like this defense needs to execute. I know, yeah, a 23 points is technically a, a decent day for a defense in the NFL these days because of how good offensives are. But, like, you can't have – you can't have – you know, you got to shut down Nick Chubb, like you said. And what I really don't like about the Bucks though, also on offense, is that how could Rashad White, who is technically a backup running back, being the number one for injury uh, injury reasons right now with uh, Leonard Fournette, how is he second in the team in receiving uh, – in catches in this game and in yards? Like – he, like you need to spread the ball out more and they consistently like can't do it. Like Mike Evans was ca- uh, targeted nine times. He caught two balls. And I've noticed this really, I think Mike Evans is the most overrated receiver in the entire NFL year in and year out. And that his a thousand yard stat is really an inflation on just um the Jameis years of he was the only guy around and he, Jameis Winston just had to air it out. And he had a, cannon of a deep ball and when you're six three and athletic yes you could just jump and you know it's a 50 50 shot and he lucked out that he has big hands and he can catch it and drop to the ground that's what mike evans is good for look at mike evans's yards after the catch it's non-existent unless it's a breakaway deep threat this man has no moves um he's a, just a 50 50 guy and he's lackluster and in my eyes he's a detriment to this offense they tom brady Besides Randy Moss, never had a deep threat, and he consistently always did well with slots. This team needs more Chris Godwins and less Mike Evans, and they would do better. Scotty Ooh. Miller. The hot my, takes that are coming today. Yes. My, my I, only I other have to question. make it up. I have to make it up for the week I missed. <laughs> <laughs> May I? <laughs> Doing a good job with that. Uh, just one question I want to throw before we move on. Todd Bowles, do we, have, do we want to put any of the blame on him? Oh, yeah. I put 75% of the blame on him because you've had you've had ha- more than half of a season to see what this team is, and you have to prepare according to what your roster has available. I mean, they I'm just looking at the numbers. Like they uh, Cleveland won time of possession by nine minutes. They oh. had they had two more, they had um, I'm sorry, they had six more first downs and they had nine more total plays, which just goes to show you that they're controlling this game throughout the entirety of it. I mean, it's just – it's inexcusable from a coaching perspective. I – I you got to put some of it on the head coach. There's no escaping it. But they've also had a lot of overall issues. I mean, you have lack of leadership, I think, on Tom Brady's part sometimes this year. They, they are experiencing injuries on that offensive line, which I think is why, you know, Brady's throwing so many checkdowns to Rashad White. So, I mean, like – and on the defensive end as well, they've lost some some linebackers this year. So – but yeah, Todd Bowles, you're not going to be able to escape it because it's the same core group of, of players, same offensive coordinator in Leftwich, same quarterback. I mean, yeah, you retained a playoff team and it's tanked. So you have to take some of that heat. You know what the number one issue is with a bad offensive line and a 45-year-old quarterback? Uh, when a head coach just says, step up in the pocket and just take the hit but deliver the shot, Tom Brady can't do that because if he gets hit, he'll die. This is the issue with aging quarterbacks <laughs> and a bad offensive line. It's not a good combo. Look at Justin Herbert. Justin Herbert on this team right now would make it a legit playoff team because oh, yeah. he's not afraid to step up in the pocket and take a beating. He has. He has half his ribs right now. And you know what? They still win games. So this team, you know, they're handicapped. They really are handicapped at this at this position. And Tom Brady's. Undefeated since divorce streak ended at only three games. He had FTX oh them. man! So, oh <laughs> yeah, that oh, that's yeah. that's definitely another podcast. Um, we saw Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals go to Tennessee, get a big victory. I think there's a reason why Joe Burrow is called Joe Cool. This dude is so calm and collective. This dude 
with an improving offensive line knows how to stay intact and uh, just get this team victories. And especially with uh, Jamar Chase out, um, they pull off a very, very, very much needed victory. And um, kudos to them. Now I think you can take this Bengals series. You know, a question I ask is this team take it seriously this week or that week? At least with the Cincinnati Bengals, I think they're at least a legit playoff team. And um, ultimately, I think they're going to win the division over Baltimore as they keep blowing games, and we're going to definitely get into that. But um, I think this is a huge breakout game for this particular season for the Bengals. You guys feel the same way as me? Matt, I couldn't agree more with you. I don't think that it's not talked enough that Joe Burrow is a sleeper MVP candidate right now. The man has 23 touchdowns, and he's third in passing right now behind Patrick Mahomes, and Patrick Mahomes has hit the LeBron James level of that he's always an MVP candidate, so we now take him out of the MVP candidate. Joe Burrow's playing lights out right now without Jamar Chase. Without Jamar Chase, with T. Higgins, who were, was people were writing off as just a wide receiver, too, is playing like a, he's number like 10, I think, in receiving yards of the season. Tyler Boyd is playing well. The offense is just humming right now, and they're missing Joe Mixon as well now to injury. And the defense, you know, the defense, the defensive coordinator is a Staten Island native, actually. Uh, they're playing sound football, doing well. And this team just, this team is start. I have the same feeling right now after 11 games that I did last season after 11 games of this team. They're starting to slowly ramp up. And they're going to be scary by week 15, even scary by week 16, and even frightening for week 17 and 18. So this is really going to be a team, I think, that's going to win the division and make a playoff push. The Bengals have, I don't know the statistics, but just from from the look, they might have the hardest remaining schedule in football. And so Joe Burrows, if he goes, if he runs through this and even goes like four and two, then yeah, he might have to be the MVP because they have such a gauntlet left on their schedule. And I was really impressed by this one. I know a lot of people are like kind of like really not giving too much credit to the Tennessee Titans, but they did win seven of the last eight games prior to this one. Mm-hmm. It was in Nashville. I think they were looking at it as a revenge game. And the Bengals came in there and handled business. They held Derrick Henry to 38 yards on the ground. You know, everyone tries to go into a game against the Titans being like, we got to stop Derrick Henry, but nobody can do it. The Bengals mm-hmm. did it. And on top of that factor about Joe Burrow being an efficient passer, I think if you give Joe Burrow at least two and a half seconds in the pocket, he has the highest passer rating in the NFL this season. Like as long as his offensive line doesn't completely collapse, he's the best quarterback in the NFL. The Bengals are for real. I think that they are definitely top three team in the AFC right now above the Bills. Yeah, I think what we saw um, kind of like a dethroning in the NFC East earlier that we talked about. Um, with the you know with the with the hierarchy no I'm excuse me it was the AFC East um, with the hierarchy changing hands um, with Buffalo kind of coming down a few notches I think the same is going on with the a balance of power in the AFC North between Cincinnati and Baltimore I thought that them going you know we'll talk about this in another segment but um, Baltimore going full on with Roquan Smith tightening up that offense getting guys healthy Lamar really being you know holding the rock I thought that this was the best team in the AFC North and that Cincinnati kind of had their best days behind them, but they've really ramped it up these past three or four weeks, winning tight games, winning winning clutch situations. And again, it's just another feather in the cap for um, for Joe Burrow because um, he's really bouncing back against, you know, uh, adversaries with, you know, a shortened staff behind him. I thought that, you know, T Higgins stepping up seven for 114 and a touchdown. Um, And even overcoming, I mean, they had, they did have some uh, missteps. They did have nine penalties for 80 yards, but the fact that they were able to tighten things up and win in close situation. And we can't overlook, you know, the the crucial penalty by, um, by Kenneth Strong at Tennessee that extended that last final drive. But even with that, you know, that takes discipline and that takes coaching. So I think that this team is for real. And I'm really excited for that 430 Kansas City game next week. Look at that. Look at that. Great stuff, gentlemen. Um, The next game I want to get into is the Miami Dolphins defeating the Texans 15 to 30. Tua routes them, yada, yada, yada. I mean, this game was all Miami at one point. It was it was 30 to nothing into the first half. I mean, we could get a little into the uh, giving up. um. 
15 unanswered points after the fact, but I don't think it's that much to worry about. All we can say is Miami is finally a legit team in this NFL. They have a tough schedule. They have a very big game against San Fran, but uh, the Dolphins, I think, um, are going to really are going to be very, very exciting. They failed to get Sean Payton and Tom Brady. You get Tua Tunga Viola and Mike Mike McDaniel instead. And look at this. Isn't that crazy? And remember, they were in a lot of bad PR with their owner before. And um, I mean, if you are a Dolphins fan, the wait has been worth it now. Um, they're, they're, they are a top team in the NFL right now. Yeah, they're legit. I think they're... I think they're the best offense in the league, you have to say, with weapons minus the 49ers um, just because of the quarterback position with them. But, um, yeah, great game, sound game by them. The defense played lights out until the end. Um, I'm a little upset that they pulled Tua just for fantasy reasons because I had Tua and Tyree kill, and I could have used a touchdown here or there. But, you know, it, ha- it happens. Um, Texans are the Texans. Uh, I don't think they should be one and on. I feel like they should have got a few wins here in uh, – here or there this season, but uh, yeah, they definitely need a new quarterback. This is definitely a team that um, is going to, I would think, draft uh, a top player and then try to get a veteran to have him either be a backup or be a journeyman. So see like a Gardner Minshew landing spot here. Absolutely. Someone of that kind of like caliber bridge guy um, I could see here, but uh, yeah, um, they're a dumpster fire, but with potential, they have some young guys around them, but uh they're definitely not even close to anywhere near the Dolphins, so this was very expected. Yeah, I believe the cover was missed. Well, I don't remember off the top of my head, but um, I feel like I don't know. It doesn't matter. Miami, Miami is a good team. Half. Okay, so wow, well, geez, <laughs> that sucks for whoever put on on that. Um, yeah, but Miami. Miami. Uh, if anything else, has anyone to add to the Dolphins are a top three team in the NFL. Hmm. Not not in the AFC, in the NFL. Top three. I do not think that there are... Yeah, I don't think there's more than two other teams who could beat them right now. I think they're that good, and I will talk about that more when we get to our picks this week. Great. Great, great so, stuff. I'll be I'll be the adversary in this, in this conflict here. I will say that they're the AFC equivalent fool's gold that I see as Minnesota and NFC. Now not in now not in the same capacity because I think their offense is still lethal and legit, but I'm still looking at some of the holes with this team. I know this is just one game, but you can't allow the Houston Texans, the dying Texans on a limb, give up five sacks to this Houston team. And you can't be able to run for sixty six yards when you when the game is essentially decided at half. After a halftime, when you come out of a halftime, you're basically just running to two o'clock. And if you can't even run the ball on the X amount of um, cat, you know, carries between Gaskin and Wilson. I, that's just not a good recipe. So I do that. There think that there is some red, um, there's some red flags and concern with this offense. And I think that the defense is just good enough to be bend, not break um, all things considered. So I'm not saying they're not a great team. I still think they think that they could win this division, but I, but I still have concerns with them competing with Buffalo and the jets in this division. And I also think that, they're somewhere in that three to five hierarchy within the AFC overall. Hmm. I just want to pump the brakes. I'm not trying to be like rain on the parade. I still like Miami. <laughs> no, of course, please. I encourage all, we all encourage all types of takes on that. And um, I get, I think that your, the way to answer that will be looking at the San Francisco matchup. So um, we'll save it for then as yeah. well. So um you know what else is up, guy? Guys, Desmond, I hate to break it to you. You said that the Commanders would lose the next four. They beat the Falcons this week off a yeah. really good Taylor Heineke game. Um, do you have anything to answer to that? Um, Brian talked about his passion for the Commanders, and especially now when they have two major divisional game, two major divisional games ahead. Uh, the Commanders. I think again, and as I was saying earlier last week and the week before, this is a this really is a legit team, especially for a team that's gotten better on defense. The do the commanders you know well do you do you want to change your mind and say they win the next four? Well, we don't want that. I don't want that, but um it, it, it's not a, out of the realm of possibility with uh getting more and more momentum with these wins. Falcons just keep finding ways to lose. They're like <laughs> 
they're it's very Detroit Lions esque. You know, I mean, like they if you if you go back to the final play of the game, Mariota was throwing a check down to I believe to Patterson, and he was basically sitting on the goal line. I mean, all he had to do was just catch it and turn in, and he and the Falcons would have won the game. But you know, one of the commanders' defensive linemen was able to like swat the ball down. So I mean, we're talking about like literal inches came between a commander's victory and a Falcons defeat. So I mean, I don't think there's a whole lot of separation between these two teams, and I think the commanders are just having a little <laughs> bit of luck. To be honest with you, I really don't think they're that good of a team. I'm in the exact opposite camp that Brian's in right now. I think the Giants are going to win both of these next two games. I do believe the Commanders still lose the next three games. They should have lost this one. I'm going to call a slight mulligan here. I don't think the Commanders are good. The Commanders are not making the playoffs. All right. Still still keep me tacked to that. And again, a lot of these will be answered in our um, – and when we look ahead to the games in Week 13 – so we did have the Broncos and Panthers play and the Broncos still can't pull it off. Even with the almost confused franchise and the Panthers of what they are doing. Sam Darnold comes in and uh, he has one of the best games he's had in years. Russell Wilson. I get as each week goes by, Russell Wilson is killing his legacy. And i never, I don't, I still think at the end of the day, especially numbers wise that, He'll be in the Hall of Fame, but he'll just be a laughing joke. Say if he retired tomorrow, like, don't you think if you are him at this point, like, wow, this has been a true 180 on just a respect level. I just cannot provide, I just cannot figure out how to get this team to win. And, uh, um, you know, people want to put it on the coach, but it's really his terrible play. And, um, I mean, I've I've seen some ridiculous takes of people saying that they'll move on from him. No, he's in a deep contract. Uh, they just got fleeced in the deal, and um, Russell Wilson he can't even get, get this game. He didn't even pass 150 passing yards. Like, I don't like. I said they'll never be. I they'll never be somebody who was so good numbers wise that they'll take his Hall of Fame candidacy away from him. But he's just just losing respect. If that's that might even be worse to some people. He's just losing respect. It's Philip yeah. Rivers. It's Phil. He plays like Philip Rivers right now. Just like constantly had padded stats, but like never did anything about it. And I like even think he, a worse case that Phil Rivers is at least he's got a Super Bowl ring and made an and arguably should have won too. But um, yeah, but that was on defense though. That was that was defensive Super Bowls right there. Like that's why they were there. If you take those mode. two se- yeah, if you take those two seasons out, like if you really think about it, he's done nothing. He's done nothing. He lost to a second, a third year Dak Prescott Dallas Cowboy uh, team that really wasn't that good, if you remember. Uh, he really, uh, he's just been over, he's had over inflated stats just based on schemes. He's had constant quality receivers around him in a good run game um, and a solid defense. He's going to put up numbers like that. He's going to be, ac- you're going to be accurate when you have a, r- a strong running game and just have to do check downs and play action. Watch a he's Russell like Wilson. Yeah. Yes, he is like a Carson Palmer. Absolutely. Um, I think this entire season is entirely his fault. I really don't even blame Hackett. I really you know, don't blame Hackett that much. I'm kind of in agreement with you because I think that there's other there's other quarterbacks out there who are able to overcome bad coaching. We see it with like Kyler Murray down in Arizona. They're not winning a bunch of games, but the Arizona offense is always a threat to score points. And again, we said I said this last week particularly, but if the Broncos had just scored 18 points in regulation in every game, they would be nine and two right now. That is insane that you are that bad, that you are that bad that you can't even score 18 points, you know, per game on offense, you're getting paid $250 million. It was hilarious to see him get yelled at by one of his defensive linemen this past game. Oh, I love that. And I'm also just happy, last thing here, that my prediction from like a month and a half ago is still intact, that I said the Broncos wouldn't win more than five games this season. I feel like I'm still (laughs) on track for that. I think you'll be fine, too. Yeah, it's looking (laughs) that way. (laughs) I think quick quick shout out with this game with the Panthers, Sam Darnold. Will he go for a little bit of like a six-game, seven-game tear right now and show some – Sam Darnold. Yeah, like, you know what? Let him play and have fun – He's never going to make himself anything in the league. Let him just enjoy his day for a couple of weeks. 
Sam, Dar- Sam, Dar- Sam Darnold putting up numbers the next six weeks is like me putting food out in the, for the homeless guy in the back and he's getting fat. Like, I don't want to hear it. Yeah, I think that a, Sam Darnold can be a good backup somewhere, maybe. 100%. Yeah. Everybody needs a body. I get it. You know what's actually crazy about this Broncos team, though? They have a, actually like a legit running game with Latavius Murray, who's a quality starter. And even what? when they had Williams when he was healthy, like – there's just no excuses. The, the pass game is just like you have all this talent on paper and you can't do anything. It has to be the quarterback. It can't not be anything else but the quarterback. Yeah, I think some people kind of thought I was kind of speaking out of pocket last year, but I felt like I was seeing some of the signs last year when he was in Seattle, just making inaccurate throws, just like not reading the field that well, just just being off in general. He just he looks off. Russell Wilson looks confused on the football field. Like he doesn't even know how to play the position anymore. Yeah. You're right. He's going to be in contract. I think supporters, including myself time to time, kind of fair. It is like, well, he's kind of mailing in because he's looking towards free agency and getting, trying to get out of there. But, you know, he did look confused. He had, you know, misreads and opportunities that he lost, he lost out on Seattle his final year. The only thing I would do want to say with, uh, with this team, that's really an embarrassment is that you let Carolina dominate time of possession 37 to 22 that's bad they ran all over them and not even just on the stat sheet but just like the time of possession total plays like everything first downs unbelievable Hmm. the ravens and the jaguars prediction made by desmond this team wound up being correct and things to take out of this one, I think Trevor Lawrence had a real breakout game. He played one of the best games of his short career or young career so far. And the Ravens, especially their defense, just can't close games. They, I mean, they just keep screwing up. They really drop the ball. And how can you trust this team if the, if the playoffs started tomorrow to, to win a playoff game? Because once you go against these much better teams, you can't hold a lead. I mean, the Ravens are in serious trouble. That's what I got out of this game. Yeah, it's definitely not good. And the sad part is that they probably have – I think they have the easiest schedule but outside the two Bengals games just because you always play well with divisional games, so those could be a toss-up. But they could go 5-1 and one in the last six games and I really still make – screw it up. And I, yeah, I still I, – I agree with you. I still think they're going to screw it up, and that's the sad thing. I also think Lamar Jackson is playing too hard for a contract right now. And I think he's trying to do too much, and it's causing the offense to sort of like hit a lull every once in a while. Would you bring him back if you're the Ravens, or would no. you just let him go? Let him go. He's too much money. He's an injury. He's gonna he's gonna become injury prone eventually with age as, as a running quarterback, and he's regressing as a passer. Like I've said year, all year long, you pay quarterback money for quality quarterbacks, not quality athletes. Oh, that's a great line right there. And at yeah. least he had a funny tweet. Just some dude he's, roasting uh, him. He's definitely taking a step back. I don't think there's any way of getting around it. And, and also to what you were saying, Brian, so a guy who takes as many hits as he does, he doesn't, he's not doing the thing that some of the quarterbacks do where they're like realizing that like, hey, maybe I should just slide here. Like maybe mm-hmm. getting that extra yard or two isn't worth taking that hit. He, right. he just never seemed to kind of, I guess, grow out of that. And his just mechanics in the pocket have just not improved over like the last like year. Like he has not taken a single step forward as a passer. I think in the last couple of years, he still is constantly looking for Mark Andrews. Every single play refuses to like scan the field for his wide receivers. They're getting frustrated. This team can't score in the red zone. I think the Ravens are a little overrated. I, I really do. I don't, I do not think that they're even in the top five in the AFC right now. I mean, if they win the division, I think it would be, it'll be because they have an easy schedule down the road and the Bengals have a really tough schedule down the road, but the Bengals are the better team in this division. No, for sure. And I think that the only thing holding, because I, I never liked the, the the discussion around who is deserving of a contract, particularly when they're in kind of a franchise year. But I think that it just, just kind of depends on what they're going to sell to him in the short term. If they're going to franchise and double franchise or just give him a short-term deal to get over the bridge. Because I think if you finish the season in the middle of the pack, you're not going to get a good draft prospect. And I don't know what their prospects are to trade all the way up, particularly with, you know, um, an expensive defense like the, uh, the Ravens team. So I think that, you know, all their eggs are kind of in one basket, unfortunately. I hate to see them kind of make, um, you know, a difficult decision um, out of fear, kind of like what Dallas did with Dak a few years back. 
um, you know, paying for the past years instead of what's in front of them. But I do think that he has definitely tremendously regressed. And I, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of just, you know, in, I guess I'm just embarrassed for this team because um, they have really like a, just tremendous potential, uh, particularly with the run game and how they've operated this offense. And you can't pay for um, a healthy body of an athlete. You have to pay for the prospects of what you're going to get as a quarterback. At least we got a funny uh, tweet out of it when uh, cats cat will kill castle will kill tweeted Lamar Jackson. When someone is asking for over 250 mil guaranteed, like Lamar Jackson games should not come to Justin to Justin Tuck. Sorry. Um, there's a turn. Ah, the, we know the kicker for the, the, the Ravens Justin kicker, Tucker. Justin, Justin Tucker. Tucker. So I did get that right. And, uh, you know, when he did have to kick a 67 yard field goal and miss, <laughs> oh, well, but, um, let Lamar walk, spend that money on a well-rounded team. He replies, boy, sh- shut the fuck up. Y'all be capping too much on this app. Motherfucker never smelt a football field, never did shit, but eat dick. And, um, we can see the frustration off Mr. Jackson for that. Hopefully he has more positive teams, uh, positive weeks and tweets after that. And I'll, this, I'll make, yeah. One well, last point uh, on this. You're saying one last point. If they end up franchising tag, tagging him and do a short term deal. Honestly, I don't think you're going, I think you have a ceiling with Lamar Jackson, trade him and get picks. Because you could be bad for a year and get yourself a top quality quarterback with a guy like him. I there's no doubt in my mind a team with the Houston Texans. You could probably sign into a short term deal and then trade him midway through the season and get yourself three first round picks just for an athlete so they could get tickets. Take, take that. Out of it. Uh for this battle of who's worse in uh two struggling um at least one one franchise that people thought would be better. And one that has done much worse. And I think now the way this is going, especially with their quarterback, they are going to be regressing for years to come. Chargers at Cardinals, though a very um, entertaining ending. Chargers pull it off. They keep their season alive technically, but do we really think that they're going to uh, make a push for the playoffs? But um, again, the Cardinals, it's just not going to work for them. I don't have anything nice to say about the Arizona Cardinals. All we know is there's going to be a uh, um, a new coach in Arizona. Yeah, I got nothing. I got nothing on this one. I think um, Chargers are still too beat up. They were lucky to get out of that game with a win. Cardinals, the Cardinals just suck. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that's all, <laughs> the Card- that's all it means someday. Here. They have, they have, maybe the best wide receiver in football and he's being wasted down there and a yep. team who I personally can't tell if it's the coach or the quarterbacks who's at fault here, or maybe it's a combination of both, but either way, the Cardinals are a dumpster fire. Mm-hmm. Damn. Yeah. That's couldn't. That's all you got to say. Ag- sometimes. Couldn't agree more, you know, happy for JJ Watt for getting another sack on it, on his nice hall of fame career. So good for you. Sack a hundred name the half, you know, we'd like to see that. And, uh, with the Chargers, you know, you got to start looking for new head coaches. I just don't like the – I don't like the game time decisions of uh, Staley, and I just don't like his philosophies as a head coach, especially with play calling. So I think it's time to move on for both of these coaches. Raiders 100%. and Seahawks. You get another win, Alex. And, uh, you know, I was very frustrated with uh, how that game ended out. Ended you up – Yes, I was. And you can probably figure out why. And um and all and take away that emotion and uh, the few dollars lost, but um the Seahawks are keeping themselves are technically are are doing their best to keep themselves in a playoff race where it looks like the and the NFC will have their division winners, then the NFC East and the Seahawks are going to battle it out for those final Wild card spots. After you lose and blow these games for Seattle, tough loss in Germany, and we had a tough loss against uh, the Raiders. Kenneth Walker had uh, Kenneth Walker has had some setbacks in this in the past couple of games. Do we think the Seahawks are going to snap out of it and make this run 
because we know that likely 49ers are winning their division. But again, when you have to go, uh, when what helps the Seahawks is that the teams they're chasing are all going to play each other. So they'll be able to gain games on them. But ultimately, the Seahawks still have to win the uh, remaining six games. And uh, they do have the advantage, a tiebreaker over uh, the Giants, which is huge for them. But do we think that the Seahawks can uh, turn their season around and have a good end of the season for a team like the Giants? Nobody really expected much out of them, and now they're at a crossroads. Do we have a team that can make a push at the end? You know, I think they're going to be pushing for that seven seed just because of the way their schedule is right now. They go Rams, Panthers, 49ers, Chiefs, Jets, Rams. So those 49ers, Chiefs, Jets, that could easily be 0-3. But at the same time, you know, it's a division game with the 49ers. That could always be a toss-up. And we don't know what the quarterback status of the Jets are. If they, you know, decide to go back to Zach Wilson and he has a terrible game, they could pull that win away. So I really just – it comes down to a lot of – They no longer, with this loss, they no longer control their playoff destination. It's more of they need to, they need a win, but they also need a little bit help now, the way I see the Seattle team. They definitely need some help. Um, And when it comes to the Raiders, you know, quality game for them. Derek Carr is still not looking like it's it for them. It's not clicking um, Mm -hmm. for this Raiders organization and him throughout their tenure and the coach is an abomination. Um, yep. to being to coaching, so but at the same time, same time, Josh Jacobs is the truth. So, uh, good fantasy day for him. Oh, I'm sure the Raiders fan. Let's uh, let's hear the <laughs> let's hear the victory speech. Oh God, yeah. Um, it, it's like one more one more week uh, abstaining from cleaning out uh, McDaniel's locker. I think. Um, <laughs> I was even looking at like that fourth down at center field when they literally have inches to get over the line and he pitches backwards from the line of scrimmage. It's like right there. You should be fired for that. Like, I'm sorry, but anyway, you know, running offenses for 20 plus years still can't get inches. Okay. Anyway, I thought this was like a classic Raiders win. Like basically Jason Jacobs goes nuts. It's a sloppy four turnover game. And Max Crosby has two uh, huge sacks to seal the game. I thought that was like the most Raider fashionable win, basically giving me six heart attacks in one game. But I think with the with the questions that we had about Seattle, I think are, are, are kind of coming true. I think that right now the Seahawks and the Niners are two ships passing in the night. One's trending upward and one's trending downward. And I think ultimately down the stretch, I think if Seattle plays their cards right, they will successfully vie for that seventh seed. But um, I take nothing in stock for my Raiders. They're still a dumpster fire. I'll be quick on the Raiders here. Um, I think they still have a shot at the playoffs. I know that may sound a little a little crazy, but uh, I think they still have the outside chance of the playoffs. Just mm-hmm. especially how the games like uh, stack up this week, the teams who are ahead of them, who they're all facing, the strength of schedule remaining for the Raiders. I don't think it's over for them. And I do not think it's over for the Seattle Seahawks. I still believe that they will win the NFC West. I wow. believe they will win the NFC West, not just be a playoff team. They will win this division. If you okay. tell me that Geno Smith is going to have over 300 yards passing, the Seattle Seahawks are going to have over 34 points, and they're going to be at home, I'm taking that every day of the week. The Seattle Seahawks defense got literally bullied yesterday, or sorry, two days ago, by the by the Vegas Raiders like running attack. I mean, that is horrendous. I think that Pete Carroll is still a defensive coach, still a good one. I think they'll clean that up. I think that's more of an anomaly than like a systemic issue for them because they've been good against other running teams this year, but you know, hats off to the Raiders, man. They, they came out there and they could just blew the doors off that Seattle defense. And the Raiders have always had talents. They've been losing close games all year. This isn't like a a bad team. They're just, I think an undisciplined team. So I didn't really think of that as being like, um, like, Oh, let's, let's, let's bury the Seahawks here. I think that was actually a good game between two good teams. Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that. Looking at it right now, first game they lost by five, second game lost by six, third game lost by two, fifth game lost by one, lost by 24 to the Saints, lost by seven, lost by five. So, like, they're in this, but at the same time, they've only beat the Broncos twice, Seattle and the Texans, so I can't give them much stock. 
But the reason I can't give you, because Desmond, I want to be hopeful and, and kind of, uh, you know, restore the troops here. But the reason I don't feel hopeful is because the way they're losing games is just so indicative of poor coaching. And that's a system, that's a systematic problem. And the fact that they put all their eggs in one basket for McDaniels and, you know, and sold the farm for this guy um, is really what really doesn't make me feel well sleeping at night. <laughs> Bad contracts suck. Bad contracts suck. No matter yeah. what sport, no matter what industry, you're stuck with someone. You're stuck with them. And I don't think Mark, uh, I don't think Mark Davis is uh, going to take all that cap hit for him. He's, he's right up there with Dan Snyder for worst worst owner. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So we had the Ra- Saints and 49ers. It just straight up didn't score the Saints. I mean, what the fuck? Uh, <laughs> does not even score. I mean, Forty Niners have a good defense, but I mean, shut down like that. And I mean, every, cl- clearly, it is everything went wrong for the Saints, and um, they're clearly going to be in the C.J. Stroud, Bryce Young. I don't think the Tennessee quarterbacks in play anymore, but um, they're just clearly going to rebuild, get a new quarterback, and uh, keep losing because that's all you could do for uh. This franchise had a lot of love in the past decade, but as it goes with any franchise you go through, it's ups and downs. And it's just too bad because you do have some talented people on defense that you're just wasting a year from them. Whether you're the Honey Badger or Cam um, or Cam Jordan, it's uh, it's uh, too bad. And then the 49ers, you'd think they'd honestly score more. Um, they hit their cover, but uh, re- regardless, I think just the... Uh, the 49ers, if there's anything, they would be taken so a lot more seriously if Jimmy G wasn't the quarterback. And when you do have these low score games like this, where you could get some more points, you know, you'd like to get a couple more touchdowns in there, maybe hit a 300 yard game. But um, regardless, and the thing that's been said and will be said until he retires, Jimmy G just wins games. And um, I think especially when we look into their matchup against Miami next week, we get more in detail with that. Um, and then, yeah, uh, you know, we're here. For this one. we're over here. So Jimmy G needs more credit. That's all I'm saying. He has a 16 to four TD, to interception ratio on this season. And we I think we're going to all look back and realize the man has had a very good, he has, he's had an Alex Smith kind of career so far in the way he plays. And He's a serviceable starter and does win games. I think we have to give him some credit on his clutch factor in the sense that he just brings a clutch aura to teams on winning. And that's maybe that's the Patriot effect or something like that. But he knows how to win, like Matt said. And I think this team can make a playoff push with him. Legit. 49ers have not allowed a single point in the second half of the last four games. Nick Mm -hmm. Bosa might be the scariest person on any NFL field. I mean, you basically have to you have to like double or triple team him every thing, every single play. Yeah. I think this whole team, this whole team is built on this, this uh, San Francisco, I think a uh, defensive line because they're able to keep so many teams from scoring and allows that San Francisco offense to basically what score 13 points and win a game. I mean, yeah. come on now. I, I and, think the cra- the- and the crazy thing is Debo Samuel isn't even having a good year. I know. Now there's some reports that actually uh, Packers might look to trade Aaron Rodgers over to the 49ers next year. Yeah, I definitely saw that. I I think for Aaron Rodgers, there's going to be three teams he'll go to. It's either the Jets, 49ers, or Raiders. And um, Miami. You really think they would take two out after this close to MVP no. year? No. With I his mean. injury history and him and his limited mobility and his arm, I don't rule it out. Oh, I wouldn't be shocked if the Colts try to get him and just keep on doing the roller coaster of veteran guys. <laughs> why not? Why, like, honestly, why not? It would, it would make sense. I think with Aaron Rodgers, he's going to – he's going to – what? You, I, I was just going to say, he might take the Brett Favre path. Just, you know, they'll just send him over to Minnesota. Finally get Kirk Cousins out of there. But I there's, think, some, there's something to be said, too, for guys who have spent their entire career up north going to a southern team, too, like – I, I don't know. I it seems it seems too good to be true, but I could see him in the Miami uniform. I think Tampa's um an option too. I think it'll be a major franchise who wherever he goes. 
Remember, if they straight up release him, he's owed oh, close to sixty million dollars. So they have to trade him. So, um, to ultimately see where he goes. So I guess it'll be a good transition to talk about that game against the uh your Eagles. 39, 30, 39, 33 to forty was the final score of this game. Desmond, did you think for one second the Packers are going to pull it off? Or after uh, Rodgers got injured and then you see Jordan Love in, you're like, nah. And the Eagles are going to just still rise up as they have some big division games ahead of them. We are so fortunate that we have, I think, the best offensive line in the league because it is bailing us out in a lot of these games right now. Our ability to just run the ball, um, maintain, I guess, like possession and just keep the opposing offenses off the field that way because the opposing offenses have been torching our defenses. Our defense has gotten lit up the last few games and I think they've gotten exposed. I think teams have the blueprint against our defense right now. I'm really, I'm actually kind of worried about it. I really am. I don't even know if the Eagles are going to finish as the one seat, even being like two, two games up on Dallas right now. Like the defense is worrying me that much. Thankfully, Jalen Hurts is having MVP season. Our running backs are being able to be, be able to be used interchangeably, whether it's Gainwell, Scott, or Sanders. And yeah, that offense that we have right now, I think they're a threat to score every single time they get on the field. I'm thankful for that. The Packers were, I mean, they they kept it as a one possession game. I thought it would be close, but I didn't think they were going to score 33 on our defense. That's very pathetic. And we really got to tighten that up going into the postseason. Yeah, you guys are in trouble. Um definitely in trouble it's not looking good on the defense right now even when you pulled in Nadamik and Sue as a last type of hope to try to get this defense rah rah up um yeah like in my opinion you guys are just gonna win the division just based off of the fact that you're 10 and 1 right now and to play catch up you'd have to lose to like the Giants Titans yeah. and then Dallas as well which I just think is very hard um to do with this team just because of the way that Jalen Hurts and the offense is playing but Come playoff time, I think you guys you guys remind me of like the Atlanta Hawks when they were the one seed in the NBA with Kyle Corver, if you guys remember that. <laughs> like high yeah. octane off high octane offense, but no defense whatsoever. Um and towards the later half of the year and they got destroyed by the eight seed Cavs. Um, yeah, that's what I'm feeling with this team. It's just like you guys have so much explosion on offense, but like the defense is like nowhere to be found right now, especially in the front seven. Um, and in your safeties, like I don't, I don't know what's happening really because you guys turn the ball over, but you guys give up so many yards that the time of possession is becoming a factor as well. I've noticed. And when it comes to Green yeah. Bay, um, you know the uh, uh, injury to Aaron Rodgers, Jordan Love season. Let's see what you got. Um, I think he should start the rest of the rest of the season. Um, and just for a comparison of. A credit to Aaron Rodgers on how good he's been, but also a uh, discredit on how bad he's been this season. He has nine interceptions on the season. The last time he's had close to that was 11 interceptions in 2010. I was 11 years old. Just like, let's put that into, <laughs> let's put that into fact right now. Like, this is a bad, this is a downhill spiral right now for, for AA run right now. And uh, I think Jordan Love has to step in and show what he has. Yeah, I think, um, over the last two seasons where he won back-to-back -back MVPs, between those two seasons, he had nine interceptions. And so to already have nine this season, I mean, yeah. I mean, that one team couldn't be missing one player more than the Packers are missing Devontae Adams right now. Oh, the pain. I wouldn't even say that. I would say that Aaron, the Packers are missing Aaron Rodgers. They're miss, they, he's a ghost right now. He's like a, <laughs> he's this is ayahuasca Aaron Rodgers. Choose your character in Street Fighter. Like it's an alternate version that you got from a cheat code on the back of a cereal box. Like we don't know what's <laughs> happening with this guy right now. And uh, if it had the MVP Aaron Rodgers, MVP Aaron Rodgers, when Devontae Adams was hurt, if you remember. They still were a good team and put up numbers, and they they won games. So I think this is not even a Devontae. Devontae Adams was a very good blanket to cover all the issues of the Green Bay franchise. I True. still love that guy. The Steelers oh, and the Colts. Mm -hmm. Questionable game. Um, questionable clock management issues towards the end of the game for Jeff Saturday. And it looked like one of the may, most the a major hole for a first time head coach in the NFL. 
And, um, you know, we're referring to uh, so the clock management towards in the in the final two minute drill of the fourth quarter. They couldn't pull off the comeback. I think Matt Ryan just looked like a confused puppy out there, but it cost them a win. And uh, mathematically, they're out of it now. So um, we'll just have Jeff Saturday um, continue his coaching career. And we'll see if he could get some more wins at least. But after the clock management issues on Monday Night Football, guys, if he continues this, do you think um, you just say, Jeff Saturday, this was a great experiment, but, uh, you know, go home to your family or something. I think this was just a result of a coach that was just not ready for for um, a situation like that. I don't know what anyone really could have done with this team. I mean, you don't have a quarterback on this team. Matt Ryan has been done for years now, and their offensive line has not been that great this year. You're watching a guy who's not that mobile, trying to navigate constantly being like rushed by every single defense that the Colts face. I mean, the Colts actually have a pretty good defense, and they've been holding up in most of these games, but – the Colts have no consistent offense besides the occasional like one or two games here where the Colts seem to manufacture more than 20 points. I mean, they're about as anemic as the Broncos are mostly, you know, I, I just, there's, there's no offensive football happening in Indianapolis. I don't know how any coach could come in there and change that dynamic in what a couple of weeks. It's just not possible. Yeah. Yeah, definitely agree with you. I think it really falls on the offensive line, though, more than Matt Ryan at times, because we've I've also noticed that when Matt Ryan started declining in Atlanta, it's when they got rid of um, offensive linemen. Offensive linemen retired there. Center went to the 49ers. I forget his name, um, but he was an all-pro center. He also played for the Browns. Um, they lost a lot of guys on the offensive line. He started regressing because he's not a mobile quarterback. Even now in this game, in this season, like they lost their left tackle, their right tackle, and Quinton Nelson's having a down year, and the center was hurt for a bit. So you know you're gonna have when you, it's, it's it's this is this team reminds me of the Buccaneers. It really reminds me of the Buccaneers, um, with a, a little bit less of uh, weapons on the offense, um, in the receiving room. But this is a this is the AFC's Buccaneers team of old, injured, aging and no future in sight. It was a win now try to kind of thing that didn't pan out. Oh, that's what they get. That's what they get. Um, Now let's look at the week ahead. Week 13. I think this is, if for your pick em leagues, this is going to be a hard one. For you hardcore football fans, this is going to be really entertaining. So many storylines going throughout. And uh, let's break it down in a fun, entertaining, and inspiring way. So let's start with the Thursday night matchup, guys. Definitely the best matchup on paper and for what's on the line. Lots to be excited for right here. So you have, excuse me, just getting this right here. Let me just get that spread. Okay, so on Thursday night, to start off the month of December, the Bills are going to New England. Huge division game, 8-15. The Buffalo Bills are opening up at minus four. And gentlemen, I think that whoever wins this game keeps their division hopes alive and playoff hopes alive. Whoever loses, I think um, they're, they kill their division hopes. And um, who knows, maybe um, some more bad losses can lead their season to be over. But bottom line, season is on the line this Thursday night for both Buffalo and New England. Where do we see this going and the implications uh, moving forward with this? I have New England beating um, the Buffalo Bills on the fact that I always trust Bill Belichick at home. Uh, the run game, I think, is going to over um, over um, stimulate the Buffalo defense, and they're not going to have no idea what to do. I also think this game is going to come down a pass rush, and losing Von Miller is a huge negative for this um, defense as uh, Desmond was talking about just with the pressures and Matt Judon has been playing lights out for the Pats and I think he's going to get to Josh Allen and really keep him on his toes the entire game so I see this game I see the Pats pulling out like a touchdown 10 point uh, win over the Patriots I mean I'm over uh, over the Bills good stuff and I'll say you know if the Bills loss and I mentioned this before they'll be their third division loss it'll be hard to make a ball that lost time 
and then just you'll just kill the momentum. You'll be very sad unless you win out after the fact. And I think you really kill their season from here. And with my pick, though, I think that the Bills are going to still pull it off just because I just don't see it in Mac Jones. I mean, kudos to uh, Bill Belichick for getting him this far. And they somehow made the playoffs last year with him. But um, I just think he's has digressed this season. And when it matters the most, I think he'll succumb to the pressure. I think I, I don't know if I read it correctly, but I saw in like uh, it was a I think it was a New York Post article. There was um like a, a like a, a like a mysterious illness running through the locker room for Buffalo too. So that's another really? fact. I didn't hear that. Yeah. yeah, it's another factor. I think it's been plaguing Someone a lot. Of poison them. them. Yeah, like a, <laughs> uh, it's like plaguing the families of uh, a lot of the players. But um, you know, just to jump in here, I think that um, Bills actually win this pretty handily and i think it's because they recognize the weight and magnitude of this game um i don't think that i think the new england offense is more of a paper tiger and i think that um with the with the coaching advantage that uh, new england typically has at home as well is um more neutralized because of how good mcdermott is and how efficient um he is with his coaching staff with leslie frazier um, I think that there's still plenty of questions with this uh, Buffalo team, but I think that they'll rise to this occasion uh, more than not. So I got Buffalo by um, a little over a touchdown. Um, for those out there who are interested in prop bets, I think <laughs> that at the end of the first half, the Patriots <laughs> will be winning this game, but I think that the Bills will ultimately pull it out and win the second half. I think that the Patriots offense is just not good enough to keep up with this Buffalo offense. I do think that Buffalo's defense will be kind of like, I think, gushed a little bit in the first half. I think that Ramondre Stevenson and uh, Harris will be able to run through that Buffalo defense. But I think that halftime adjustments, Bills will take this game by at least a touchdown. That's what I had. All right. Good, good pick, gentlemen. Picks. The next one, we have the New York Jets going to Minnesota to play the Minnesota Vikings. Minnesota opens at minus three. Mike White, I think this is your real test if uh, you earn all the praise he's getting. And I don't think the Jets are going to pull off this win. I think the uh, uh, Vikings will cover. I think it will be close, but um, I ultimately see this going to the 1 p.m. Kirk Cousins. um, The 1 p.m. Kirk Cousins... uh, (laughs) <laughs> line of the story and line of thinking though it will be very interesting to see sauce Gardner versus justin jefferson i think that'll be fun to watch oh, yeah. but um i do think uh minnesota is going to pull this off yeah i agree with you i think um when it comes to 1 p.m kent and kirk cousins you know i think <laughs> that he will show up in this game but i think that the story is going to be that i think that mike white will uh, show up in this game for the Jets offense. I have them scoring at least 21 points in this game. I think that this is going to be a close game. I think the Vikings are just incapable of actually blowing a team out. So I think this game is probably going to be closer to like 27, 24 Vikings. So I think it should be one of the better games this weekend. That'll be fun. I agree completely with that, Desmond. Yeah, I got nothing to add. <laughs> we have the Commanders and Giants playing. Washington opens at minus two and a half. And, um, well, I thought it was actually uh, much farther than, than it was originally reported. Or might I might have just seen it somewhere else. But at minus two and a half, um, this is a game where you have to pick between your head and your heart. And I still do think that the Giants will uh, pull this off at home. I'll say one thing, if they lose... Um, we're we're on a downward spiral, and um, this this game really matters. I do think Saquon can bounce back. I think um, it's not going to be easy. You might only win by a field goal, but um, especially with some of the injury players, some people who are injured returning, especially on the defensive side, I think we can um control Heineke, get that a uh, running back by committee down, and I think that's going to be the key to victory if we could just limit their offense which this Giants team and defense is capable of doing at this level. So I do think the Giants are going to win. They're going to win by three, just barely cover. Um, and uh, it'll be good. It'll be good after that. I think this game is um, 
on a silver platter for Ron Rivera. I think as a seasoned coach and a defensive guy, um, getting, you know, your monsters on the front four back healthy um, and knowing that this offense for the Giants is essentially one dimensional when you take Saquon out of the game um, and you put your fate and the ball in Daniel Jones' hands. I think that um, this is kind of a no brainer, but I won't put it past Washington to fuck it up. So um, I say it's essentially, you know, I, I, I essentially say it's a toss up. I think that uh, this game could go either way as well as the next week. And I think that Washington could prevail as long as they shut down Saquon. Giants. Just keep it that simple. Giants win this game. The go commanders big blue. are overrated. They're not going to the playoffs. Yeah, I'm going to take the commanders on this one just off of the pass rush alone and the run game right now I think is more consistent than Saquon, even though Saquon has the yards. that though That's usually a boomer bust kind of guy. Um, in fantasy terms, so but also in the real NFL, he is a boomer bust kind of guy. So I think he might have a little bit of a slump right now, and that buy is going to help him out, and then he'll play better in the second Washington game. But I think he's going to he's going to hit that little like midseason rut right now. Um, when it comes down to it, I think that Tyler Heineke does better under pressure than Daniel Jones, and I think that's what we're going to see here. Also. The Giants don't really have a pass rush as well. So I think Heineke is going to be a lot more comfortable than Daniel Jones. Another close one, pretty much a pick for this one. At only the spread opening at minus one, the Steelers are at the Falcons. For yeah. a Falcons team, try to keep their season alive. For a Steelers team, try to see if they have anything with Kenny Pickett. I think... Kenny Pickett will uh, pull it off for the Falcons and it will just lead to a real mess and a tease when you thought that the Falcons were going to win the division. This will put the nail in the coffin and have them lose it. And uh, it'll be all the hands of good coaching from Mike Tomlin and uh, Kenny Pickett finally having a good game that we're a breakout game that we've been waiting to see him pull off. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I think Pickett's going to have that that breakout game. I also think that this is going to be the T.J. Watt coming home kind of game, like fully back into the swing of things, healthy, um, making some making a splash, um, having a few sacks. So I expect a complete rout of the Falcons. I think this is the first time that Kenny Pickett's going to go into a game favored, and I do think that the Steelers have the superior team, but. I'm kind of just smelling a, a, little, a bit of a letdown from the Monday night game. I think that Steelers might be walking into this game feeling a little overconfident. I think the Falcons might be able to squeeze out a close victory here. Falcons. I think that, yeah, I think that the Falcons smell weakness on Tampa. And I think that this is their opportunity to pounce, particularly with, um, you know, a full head of bravado from Pittsburgh coming into this game, um, particularly on a short week as well. Um, I think that the Falcons win a tight one, but it's unwatchable. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry, that's, the Packers that's my are... favorite thing about this podcast. It's unwa- I love when you just go. It's unwatchable. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's such a clear statement. It is, and he's been quite accurate with it too. Good job like calling it. If they had the terror watch list at Gitmo, they would like strap guys to chairs and make them watch this game. <laughs> Straight up punishment. So we have the Packers playing the Bears. Green Bay opening at minus four. Can Aaron Rodgers, again, despite his terrible, a terrible season, him and his team having, and um, he is playing. It's confirmed that despite his injuries this past week, he will start. Do we see Aaron Rodgers just owning the Bears as per usual? I say yes, especially if Justin Fields isn't coming back. And honestly, there's no reason to bring him back for the rest of the season. Um, the Green Bay Packers are going to win this easily. Agreed. Nothing else. I love Aaron Rodgers. I um, I the think dude. Justin Fields is going to play. You think they'll still let him play? Uh, he was a game-time decision last week. It, I mean, it's not on his throwing shoulder. It's his non-throwing shoulder. Yeah. I think I, I like this kid's demeanor, man. I was so wrong about him at the beginning of the season. He's shown the hell out ever since he's like really kind of like they revamped that offense when they faced the Patriots. I think he's going to play this week. I think if he plays this week, I think that they actually trounce the Packers. But he's wow. the X factor. If they don't, if he doesn't play, then yeah, Packers win. But I think he's going to play, so I'm going to pick the Bears, and I think it's going to be a big win for the Bears. 
So I think I think inevitably I think the Packers win a really tight, ugly game, something like seventeen to fourteen or seventeen thirteen. But I think it's only because Chicago hates Aaron Rodgers so much, and they see that this team is down and out in Green Bay, and this is like their opportunity to kind of like rub it in their face at home. So I think that they're going to push them around, uh, particularly on the ground game. Um, they'll probably run all over them. I just think that Green Bay will just make enough one or two plays enough to win over the top at the end. So we have the Jaguars and the Lions playing another pick them for this pretty much Jaguars only opening at minus one against the Lions. I think the uh, I think the Jaguars are going to end the Lions winning streak and things are going to keep clicking and people are going to be like the Jaguars are on the rise. Well, I mean, you know, for to be fair, we have been saying that anyways, but they will uh, get more people excited for them. And Trevor Lawrence will keep improving his stock. And maybe he will um, finally get the love that he was getting back in uh, Clemson. But now having some more NFL wins under his belt can only uh, make things more excited for the uh, tall blonde one. Jaguars yeah, winning. Yeah, definitely, definitely agree on the Jaguars winning. I just think there's too much um offense on that Jaguars roster for the Detroit Lions defense to handle. I saw this game and it felt like cruel and unusual to have people pick this game because can you really rely on either one of these teams in any given week? I think the answer is <laughs> no. I'm only picking the Lions because they're at home. And I really do believe in Amon Ra St. Brown and this running attack for the Lions. But I mean, th- these are two of the worst teams in the NFL right now, unfortunately. Um, but Lions. Yeah. Oh, I could not I could not disagree more with the last part of that. With I don't think these are the two worst teams. I think there's definitely a bunch of bottom feeders below them. I think they're both teams that are just figuring out their identity and, and trying to get, you know, some things that work together towards the end of the season. But um, Jacksonville on the rise is just as much as Urban Meyer getting a rise on a, on a bar stool. So I don't think that the teams <laughs> they were either. Um, I think that because – Quarter of the year. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, like what Desmond said, like the only reason I'm picking Detroit is because they're at home. I'll keep it as short. I just want to get that joke in. <laughs> That's funny. Um, we have the Titans and the Eagles going at it. Going at it. Eagles minus five opening this one at home. What's about to happen? I think the Eagles are going to win this game. I think. Um, I think they're going to pull off another home victory. I think they will have their. I think they'll have um their work cut out for them. But I think uh Philly's going to get this one. I think Tennessee is going to have a bounce back game, and I have a feeling that this will be the second loss for Philadelphia. Um, in a few, with a you know, it's going to start the downfall for Philly right now. I think this is going to be the game. If they win this game, they're going to go to the Super Bowl. If they lose this game, it's going to be a very hard, uh, very hard of a uh, hard uh, way to get there. It's like an act of a uh, act of contrition right now. You know what I mean? A, a war of attrition. I mean, right here, this is the game. I think the game's going to come down to whether or not our offensive line is going to be able to kind of impose their will on Tennessee's defensive line because I think our offense is explosive enough to kind of put Tennessee in a hole. And if we're able to go up like two or, you know, maybe like even 17 points early on Tennessee and force them to be a one dimensional passing team, I think they're not going to be able to do that. Um, But obviously, I'm always picking the Eagles. I don't even know why you come to me on this one. But I, um, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the Titans have a real good shot of beating us. They're they're one of the teams left to scare me. So I think that this ultimately comes down to kind of what Desmond said, like the Titans' defensive line, because I've been like hypercritical of them because I think they've been kind of the key to victory for this team all year round, and I think that's a lot of the trickle down from Brable and his, um, you know, his influence as well. I think the, the magic number for the Titans is. Um, 175. If they can keep Philly's run game well below 175, I say they win this game. Um, I think that's the only way that Philly can kind of pull this off right now. Um, I think that they got a lot of issues, and I think that the Titans are kind of primed for a bounce back game, particularly when you consider how they lost that Cincinnati game. It's got to be killing them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we have the Broncos and the Ravens. 
Baltimore minus eight full points. They're at home. Man, for two quarterbacks, you really use a victory this week. Where do we see this going? I think um, I don't think Denver is ever winning again for the rest of the season. I think Lamar Jackson will pull it off, but um, I think they'll almost blow it. I think they'll win, but they won't cover. If you're fans of either side in the in the crowd, better watch out for these passes because they're going to be all over the place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think this is a must must win to save their season for the Ravens. Um, I don't really see it as competitive. I think it'll be like a twenty three ten kind of game, Baltimore winning at home. Yeah, agreed. Nothing much else really to say. It, it, it's a must win for the Ravens, and if you know. It's just going to be another bad Russell Wilson game. And honestly, I would like to see some accountability by him owning up to his mistakes because I haven't seen that yet in the press conferences after uh, his losses. So maybe this will be an eye-opener. I uh, got the Broncos winning this game. I <laughs> think that the Broncos' defense is the one standout for this team. And the Ravens have been kind of struggling in these close games. And I think the Broncos will score enough points to actually – upset this Ravens team who seem to can't get out of their own way right now. Oh, oof. don't oof. want that to happen, Ain't but um, it'll be funny to watch. <laughs> now this game definitely next to um, between obviously the big games of the year, your Thanksgiving game, your opening kickoff last game of the year, any holiday game. This game was obviously recognized and people have been looking forward to it for good or bad reasons since it was announced in the summer that Deshaun Watson would get an 11 game suspension, that he would come specifically for this week 13 matchup against his old team. And, um, well, there's a lot going on in Houston. So we have the Cleveland Browns going against the Houston Texans. Cleveland opens at minus seven. And um, we have Deshaun Watson's first game in two seasons, not just one, but two seasons. Um, it's been, I don't know if it's been confirmed, but at least has been rumored that we all know that Deshaun Watson is under heat for sexual misconduct allegations. And allegedly uh, the clients who are um, pursuing legal action against him will be in attendance for the game. They're going to get a suite by their representation and they're going to be out there as obviously a major distraction for this game. And, um, and I think uh, Deshaun Watson is obviously going to feel that pressure there and throughout the rest of this season and maybe even next season beyond, because there's still a trial awaiting him that he will just get nothing but bad PR. He will get bad. Um, he will get bad people on his ass and he will get criticized and you know rightfully so so regardless though i think that's going to play a factor into this and with that i say pick houston houston with this game despite all being only one nine and one and really struggling i just think with all that bad karma against deshaun watson it's going to lead to him losing in his cleveland browns debut couldn't agree with you more. You know, I can't I can't trust to creep that quarterback. So uh, definitely not going with Cleveland right now. And the way I think about it, honestly, is Jacoby Brissett played a hell of 11 games. I think it's a disservice to this team on a leadership and a locker room standpoint to even allow Deshaun Watson to play the rest of the season, to play a single game this season. Jacoby Brissett has earned the right to be a starting quarterback in this league and be a starter for the remaining uh Right, you know, six, seven games for this season for this team. So I think Karma's going to bite them in the ass right now, and I think Houston's going to rout them. I, I, Jerry Hughes, old man Jerry Hughes on the Houston defensive line is going to have a field day stacking Deshaun Watson. The Browns haven't been a great team all year, but they haven't been a bad team. You know, if Jacoby Brissett was the quarterback, I'd pick the Browns easily. I think there's a little bit of an X factor here with Deshaun Watson being the quarterback and going into Houston. This game might even be sold out, but I can't in good conscience pick a team who's only won one game. That That's really what this comes down to. This is really like, you know, the Browns are great. It's more or less the Texans just are, they're nothing. So, I mean, like, I don't, I don't even know if they're even like trying to win at this point. They might be just tanking for all we know. I, I can't trust the Texans here. I got to go with the Browns by default, to be honest. 
Well, I have the Browns winning by default, but for the opposing, for the exact opposite reason, I think that Texans are Texans are going to come out full force for this with all knives out. Um, you know, metaphorically speaking, but I just think that um, I just think that inevitably the Browns are going to win just because Houston's bereft of any talent. Um, I think it'll be an ugly slugfest. Ultimately, in a game we skipped evolving this team, Rams and Chiefs. The only thing we just say, Chiefs are great. Rams suck, and they really sucked without um Matt Stafford this week. That was unwatchable. Truly was unwatchable. I could not stand watching um Bryson, what's his name? It doesn't even not even worthy to doesn't remember matter. his last name. I was happy but, when you skipped it. <laughs> <laughs> anyways, though, um, we do have they still have to play another game, and um the Seahawks are going to LA. The Seahawks are minus seven and a half. And um, I think the Seahawks are going to win and get some more momentum and a must win game for them to keep their playoff hopes in a more comfortable position. So Seahawks are going to win this. Yeah, I got Seahawks winning this one. And I think they cover too. Um, the Rams have nothing to offer on offense right now. This is they're in total free fall mode right now. So I don't know how you can pick them in any game for the rest of the season, unless they're facing the Broncos. Expect a monster bounce back game from Kenneth Walker. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Um, next, we have the Dolphins and the 49ers. Firstly, I think this game should be flexed and uh, they should play uh, this on Sunday night. Um, but Wait. they're not going to do that. Uh, and uh, it's going to just be a very big four o'clock game. And C- San Francisco opening at minus four. With uh, who knows? Maybe this is a Super Bowl matchup, um, waiting to happen. I think it's going to be a very close game, and I think this is really tough to pick. But my <laughs> gut is telling me to pick the Forty Nine ers because of um, the one thing Miami's running game they they have. They you know they keep playing with their committee. But there's nothing strong with their running game. And as we mentioned, the 49ers pass rush is probably the very best in the whole NFL. And I think they're gonna take advantage of that. And um they're gonna they're gonna get they're gonna give a hard game to Tua to Tua. And ultimately I think San Francisco is gonna pull this game off in a true slobber knocker. And um that's again because the 49ers defense is gonna give a hard game for Tua. And um, as well as their stellar weapons. Yeah, I couldn't agree more um, to take Matt. I think this is the most important game of the week just because of the fact that we're going to see what team is legit. We're going to see we're going to we're going to get all our questions answered in this game is two of the guy for real against the number one defense in the league. Could the running back committee by committee for both teams work against these defenses that have very good run uh run defenses um are we gonna how are we gonna see um you know Jalen Waddle and Tyreek Hill against you know the 49ers defense but also how are we gonna see the uptick in Brandon Ayuk against Xavier Howard uh there's a lot of questions that will be answered here I think the 49ers will win just based on the pass rush alone um, all I pray is that Tua stays upright the entire time because we've seen him against pressure. It gets very bad for him. So uh, I hope everyone stays healthy. But I think the 49ers, I think the 49ers go away winning a, a comfortable lead, 10 points. I'm in the exact opposite camp. I think the Dolphins win by 10 points here. I think that Mike McDaniel is very familiar with with this Mike Shan. Oh, sorry, with this Kyle Shanahan, you know, team. Obviously, he was an assistant there. I think that you're going to just see that at the end of the day, there really is no scheme that you can put in place that's going to contain both Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. And with Tua being a mobile quarterback, even though you have a great defensive line in San Francisco, I don't think they're going to really be able to handle it. I don't think they've seen an offense like this this season. I expect the Dolphins win by 10 this game. I um I'm gonna stay closer to Matt on this one. Um, I think it's gonna come down to a one possession game, regardless of who wins. Um, I'd like to couch, you know, and reserve my pick uh for the day of, but I think either way, it's gonna be a shootout. And um, you know, Desmond's right, 100 percent that um the familiarity with this team 
uh, for McDaniel is definitely a huge upside and tremendous neutralizer for Miami coming into this game. Wait, you can't just not pick a team. What, what is this? <laughs> yeah. What is this? Flip a, flip a coin. <laughs> you gotta pick somebody. Flip All right, fine. I'll take I'll take San Fran by a field goal. Watch right. that be the outcome too. Um, <laughs> hey. Another big four o'clock <laughs> game: the Chiefs and the Bengals. This is seeding being decided in this game. Um, it's gonna be a lot of fun with uh one star quarterback against another, proven draw versus proven draw. And I ultimately and and um sorry, the spread is minus two and a half. This is gonna be really you get your two TVs. You have Fox with this game and then um CBS, sorry, Fox with the uh Dolphins and 49ers, and you have CBS with the Chiefs and Bengals. I think this game is going to be another slobber knocker as the game previously mentioned. And I'm actually going to go with Joe Burrow. And I think he's going to, him and the Bengals are going to create another upset victory over the Chiefs. And then people will say, oh, Joe Burrow has Patrick Mahomes' number. I mean, hey, in those two games, he will at the moment. I think their winning streak against the Chiefs continues. Take the Bengals plus two and a half. So, for me, this what this should have been flexed for the Sunday night game, and yeah. I would have had Dolphins 49ers as the Monday night game. But I totally agree. I think that um, this is Cincinnati's for the taking. Um, they can really snatch their fate here, both in terms of the AFC hierarchy, but also to, to cement this division for themselves as well. I thought this day, game in the regular season, dating back to last year, was probably the best game of the year. And I think that this game is going to be no less of a sell. Um, I think it's going to come right down to the wire. Um, I have Cincinnati winning in a similar epic fashion. I would I feel comfortable. With you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, nothing else. I agree with both of you. It's going to be it's going to be like mm-hmm. a, the AFC Championship game again. I think the Chiefs really want this one, and the Bengals are coming into this game undermanned. You know, not having Joe Mixon who might still be in concussion protocol, not having Jamar Chase. Chiefs are a juggernaut, man. I just, I I think that at full strength, the Bengals could win this game, but I think that the Chiefs are on a mission this year. I think they win a touchdown, like 27-20 type of a game. Okay. Good stuff, good stuff. Chargers and Raiders, a 425 game that not many people, not as many people care about, but they're still going to play. Chargers open... (laughs) Chargers open at minus two. Um, you know what? I'm going to pick the Chargers on this one. I think they're going to uh, keep their momentum alive. Maybe Brandon Staley wants to keep his job. This would be a game to do that. And um, with, I think the Raiders winning streak will come to an end. And um, and Justin Herbert will have a heck of a game, especially um, if uh, you could have what Keenan Allen and Mike Williams were doing earlier in the season, bring them back with uh, this important division game for them. Raiders. I'm gonna go, yeah, Raiders, you have to. I just hope I, that they don't kill Josh Jacobs this game because, like, he's going to lose a, a year of his career just off of the sheer amount of carries from this season. So, like, I hope it's not another, like, 30-carry, 300-yard game for him just for the sake of his body. They need to resign that man. Like he's done great over the last several seasons. Um, he's done great this season too. Raiders, well, though, I think they're gonna. I think they're gonna keep rolling. I think the momentum's real right now. They're at home. I like it. The fact they haven't resigned him to an extension is just another sign signifier that they're a badly run organization. <laughs> resigned him probably two years ago. Um, got <laughs> dollar, but now he's gonna ask for a big payday. And because they can't run an offense without him, without featuring him. I think that they're going to have to pay him. Um, but I, I think that the Raiders will probably win um, a close game. But this is definitely the bowl of which coach wants to get fired faster. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I'll That's tell you funny. this, though. Don't resign Josh Jacobs because as a Cowboy fan with Ezekiel Elliott and other running backs that we saw with DeMarco Murray after he left, <laughs> after these seasons he's had, he's going to be dead, his body. So don't even waste the time. You had fun and you wasted his prime. It's okay. I know Brian had a great Thanksgiving night last year. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> Daniel Carlson made me cry. 
You have the Colts and the Cowboys played on Sunday night. Brian, no one wants to see this. It's all your fault. <laughs> you know, honestly, this game I'm a little worried about because, like, we know how the Colts are so wishy-washy, and they've been wishy-washy for two weeks now of bad. This could be their good offense week. Um, I just have a feeling about it. So I think it's going to be a lot closer than we think. You know, some people may think of this as, like, a Minnesota 40-3 game. I see this more as, like, a... Honestly, I see this as like a 35, no, like a 34 to like 27 game. This is a the biggest spread of the week. The oh. Cowboys are opening at minus 11. Yeah, no one's really taking this game seriously, not even the fans. I mean, if you look at ESPN right now, they show you like how like the cheapest ticket in the stadium. And it was like, <laughs> they're going for like, what, $23 right now to go watch this game in Jerry's world. <laughs> Not only are the Cowboys going to win, I think they'll they'll cover. I, I think they definitely cover the the eleven. I mean, the Colts have no offense. You, you can't win if you can't score. I'm sorry, the, the right. Colts have no zoom, offense. Zoom, Get out of here. This should be over by halftime, Cowboys. Then Monday night, Tom Brady and the Buccaneers are going to be at home playing against whoever the hell the New Orleans Saints are. Is Drew Brees isn't coming out of that locker room? Tampa's. <laughs> Tampa's my coming out minus three and a half. I think Tampa's going to win this and uh, get back to five hundred. And uh, if, he will resume his winning ways post divorce. So yeah, Tampa Bay is going to win this hand easily, but you know I'd like to see Mike Evans actually like run a route. So like hopefully he like wakes up this week. Something's off with the Bucks. There's just no getting around it. Something is off with them. They came off a bye and still lost to the Browns. It would not shock me at all if the Saints win this game. In fact, the Saints will win this game for no other reason than the the Buccaneers just can't seem to figure out how to be consistent on either side of the ball. And I just feel like they're going to find a way to lose this game. I don't think the TV 12 method is mixing with those guys over there. I think the whole diet and everything, I just don't, I don't think it mixes with them. Like it's okay to eat cheeseburgers, man. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) They want the grease and like Vita Vea wants his five guys burger. Let him be. (laughs) It's okay to eat burgers. Definitely a great quote. Dennis Allen is notorious for having Tampa in his back pocket. Um, I think that if there's, if there's like a six to three win this year, this is that game. I think Tampa. I think. Um. I think. Uh. I think the world <laughs> wins like six three, like a horrible shit game on a Monday night. Just one quick fun spread. On Saturday, in football, the Netherlands are playing against the United States in their first uh, round of sixteen knockout pool. There's no spread. Who wins? The Americans or the Netherlands? Let's just say go America. I'm just gonna say that America's USA, gonna win. USA, USA. We don't win soccer games, man. That, that's <laughs> a, this isn't basketball. <laughs> I mean, we're not, we're not that good internationally. Yeah, I, I watch paint dry for a living. I'm not doing it again. <laughs> no I, no you can't way. ask me to pick the U.S. In, in a game that we traditionally like. Just do not give a damn about. No. What's, this is like <laughs> this. This is like watching soccer after you've watched American football. It's like giving uh, a piece of fruit to a kid after he's had candy his whole life. Like, I don't think so. Oh, no, man. man. No, the <laughs> American. No, the Netherlands. Netherlands okay. Won. Go, go Netherlands. Not only that, the U.S. won't score a goal. Okay. Well, good, good, legitimate <laughs> take, Desmond. And anyone interested in these uh, college games, whether SEC championship, LSU and Georgia oh, yeah, no. or, or Big 12, we could go through them quick. Um, go Bulldogs. So you say the Bulldogs are going to be – SEC champions secure a playoff position. Yeah, LSU's there's, deflated there's, after that loss to AM. Yeah, they are opening at minus 17 and a half. Big 12 oh, championship oh. with TSU and Kansas State. TSU only open at minus two and a half, trying to uh, secure a playoff position. Kansas you know State what? was up like 28 to 10, I think, at, in the second quarter of the last time that they played each other. Doesn't surprise me at all if Kansas State wins this game. Just because you mentioned TCU, automatically I think of who? The Red Rifle, Red Rocket himself, Mr. Andy <laughs> Dalton. I switched my take 
Saints win by Saints win by a whopping fourteen points against Tampa Bay, <laughs> just because oh. it's on a good weekend for TCU. There it is. I usually TCU think of Damian Thomas in that. An AC, <laughs> a, the AAC championship in Tulane and UCF. Minus Whoa. three for Tulane. UCF. Tulane has a good logo. Tulane has a good logo. I go. All with right, that. we'll go with the good logo take. Um, Big Ten championship. Purdue and oh, Michigan, God. 16 and a half spread. Oh, Purdue think, doesn't yeah, even have a quarterback, bro. No, I mean, Michigan's known for sometimes playing down to their competition, but they should still cover. And then yeah. for the ACC championship at Clemson and North Carolina with Clemson minus uh, seven and a half. North Carolina, Clemson's, Clemson, Clemson, Clemson's, Clemson's gold. Clemson's going to come out flat because they're going to be upset about losing that game to South Carolina. I think North Carolina pounces yeah. on them. So they want it more. North Carolina. It's going to be a good time, gentlemen. Great week of football, professionally at college level. I'm really excited to talk about the week ahead next week. And um, we're going to have a really good show next week, guys. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And that oh, countdown starts now. Yep. Quick, I want to plug uh, Pac-12. Yeah. USC is going to make the playoff when they beat Utah. I saw they oh, made number boy. four. Yeah. yeah. So you say um, Pac-12 going to secure that uh, position and win the uh, Pac-12 championship? Yeah, Champions. USC is going to get in. All right. I'd like to see that, something different. And yes. uh, we'll take Anybody that. Anybody but Bama. Anybody but Bama. And Ohio yeah. State. Yep. <clears throat> All right, gentlemen. Great job, as always. Desmond, Alex, and Brian. We'll see you next week for a very crucial NFL season, uh, an NFL week ahead. Have a good week, everyone. Peace. Take care, gentlemen.